despite his poor record on labor rights and working conditions. He saw migrant workers die in build up to the FIFA World Cup last year. Morocco is another of these countries, also caught up in the same corruption allegations. Until last week, the European Parliament hadn't condemned it for 25 years, even if its track record on imprisoning journalists isn't great. While there are arguments for Brussels' pressure on human rights has caused some countries to change course, is it a matter of double standards for the EU when the pros outweigh the cons? Mr. Pitchers there asking if it's a matter of double standards for the EU. So the big question, does the EU really care about human rights? So I'll start with you over here as a member of the European Parliament where you're sitting, mingling every day with members of the European Parliament. What would you say to that? Of course we do. And we do it every day and we do it honestly and truthfully. The thing is that we are not the only co-legislators here. I mean, it's not only us who legislate, but also the Commission and the Council, where often things are blocked, to be honest, when the national government gather to make decisions about the EU. And the second thing is how we make decisions on foreign affairs uh, in the EU. I mean, we do not have legislative competence when it comes to foreign affairs. It's still a national competence. So that issue, uh, for us as MEPs, as as directly elected members of the parliament, of our voters, our citizens, is giving us headache because we feel the pressure and we know that our citizens want us to stand up for human rights, basic values that our union is based on, not only within the European Union, but also outside globally. And it is difficult from where you're sitting there, uh, representing the European Policy Centre, the economic think tank, the political think tank, but also human rights, an issue of importance for you. What would your take be on that? Well, human rights is, is very important. I think it always has been for the EU, but I think you often see that the EU is driven by short-termism. So clearly there's double standards. There's short-term uh, concerns, for example, to do with migration or security issues, more recently energy dependency. And I think therefore it's important that the EU uh, looks for a much longer-term um, vision. And I think you, you see that the EU is trying to do that, and certainly for example, when it comes to China, who is certainly buying also its impact in regions like um, Africa, the Global South, it's important that we need, do not only care about our own concerns, be it again economic or driven by migration, but we have a vision, not just for Europe, but also for the region. And I think that is really important that it's a reciprocal feeling. And Teresa, what about you, from your perspective, do leaders of Svenska Dagblad care about human rights, or would they think, no, it would be wrong with it? I think that, I mean, a cynic's answer would be that there's a bit of a cherry picking in which human rights we really care for, isn't it? I mean, uh, do we sell weapons to a certain country? Then maybe we don't care too much to bang on about human rights in that country. I mean, I'm from Sweden, it's a big weapon exporting country, so I, I don't need to think about any other country. And then we do care about human rights maybe in countries that we are not as economically interested. But the EU in, as a group, I think, is actually quite good at trying to at least, you know, introduce paragraphs on human rights in trade deals or in uh, any other kinds of deals. So as a group, they work better than I say separately. Okay. So one organization, of course, that's been banging the drum for, for years and putting pressure on the EU to promote human rights ahead of business and political considerations is the NGO Amnesty International. Mm. And our Paul Laura Papineau had the opportunity to speak to Hussein Baoun from Amnesty International here in Brussels to ask him what's at stake and what he thinks about EU relations with countries like Egypt. Israel, what will always be the most uh, in the near future is that we will see a continuation of business as usual. So on the one hand, we see uh, European leaders uh, claiming that they want to promote human rights, claiming that they care about human rights, claiming that human rights is a key aspect of their engagement with uh, uh, countries um, outside the European Union, while at the same time, we see them as giving red cards to uh, leaders who are being responsible for massive human rights violations, uh, for war crimes. So what worries me the most is the continuation of this, which results in a loss of confidence uh, in, um, in the European Union's leaders uh, from um, people uh, that don't care about the European Union. Hussein Mawani there from Amnesty International describing the fact that this is having creating a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lack of confidence even in, in the European Union project itself. I think what diplomats, countries, governments also do, and it's hard to explain to the voters sometimes, is that they say, oh, you know, we condemn the, the, the crimes committed by this and that country. 
but still we keep the diplomatic doors open, we keep the doors open, we keep the connections open. And that's sometimes how to, I think there's a knee-jerk reaction to, you know, oh, let's, sh you know, that country is violating human rights, let's throw it out of the Olympic Games, or let's throw it out of all our diplomatic gatherings. And I think to the bitter end, they always try to keep the doors open, because once you shut the door, then how are you going to persuade that, that particular country to, to do better? That's, I mean, that's the, the, the thing, whether you agree with it or not, but it's hard to explain to voters why we just don't cut our ties with all these countries. And that's the situation that you're probably often in as an elected member of the European Parliament explaining these issues mm -hmm. to your voters when they're standing there screaming at you going, why is this happening? Why are you safe here? Well, I mean, there, is, there are different grades of human, uh, human rights violations. Uh, let's agree to that, at least. And I think that what makes it very important is that we react on time and we don't allow for a certain development to take place because we, we always know we have these uh, uh, signals prior to major crackdowns on human rights that this, I mean that this development is going that way and that's why our reaction that is timely it is very very important because I think we need to be very clear on our signals when discussing with these uh, uh, countries. I understand the will of the diplomats to keep the doors open, but not all in all cases. Sometimes it goes beyond my understanding. I mean, we know that in certain countries, we don't even have so, uh, so, so much of economic ties or any diplomatic ties. And we still continue, because I think that the, dip the diplomatic corps isn't conservative one that has that always works in certain ways and it, it keeps it likes to keep this you know the same methods ongoing because it doesn't want to change but we are living in, actually in a small village because uh, Instagram TikTok Facebook is bringing the world to our uh, not only uh, homes but you know very very uh, intimate space and we cannot shut it down so many people they are, they are following developments, the situation in different countries from other peers that are in the same situation. Maybe they have the same age and the same kind of job and where they are connected and they see the, the, the situation from their eyes, not from a political or dip diplomatic eyes. And that's why we cannot keep doing what we are doing. We cannot keep on Economic fighting for business as usual. Uh, and not fighting for human rights the way we have been doing. And your photo went viral last October in the European Parliament. I'll tell our viewers in a minute why. But first, Elizabeth, I'd like to get your perspective on whether or not the EU would think it was struggling financially if it did put uh, if it didn't put its economic interests first. Well, I, I don't think so. I think I'm also building on what you said. I think the EU underestimates often what it can do. I think there's much more that the EU can do beyond just economic and financial support. Clearly. Um, the EU should uh, put pressure on international actors and work via them, such as the UN, but also ensure that, for example, in the countries concerned, and we saw a few quite telling examples, that the EU supports civil society, but also from within, there's actors that really support uh, protest movements. I think that's very important as well. And on that note of protests, of course, protests are still taking place in Iran. We saw protests here in the EU quarter of Brussels as well this week as foreign affairs ministers were meeting to introduce sanctions, new sanctions on the Iranian regime. And of course, yourself, with your, you spoke earlier about that's how you went viral. You went viral because you spoke at the European Parliament plenary session in, in Strasbourg back in October, in early October, and you cut your hair. Can you tell us about that moment and if you feel that that moment then has changed anything? Well, I mean, uh, this is what I was talking about, that the diplomatic corps is a conservative one and that likes to uphold the same methods of working. And I mean, it was a week after the UN General, As General Assembly where nobody spoke about the protesters of women in Iran. Uh, at that time, it was, it, the protest was driven only by women, solely or mainly. And Mahsa uh, Amini's body what has not been called yet. I mean, it was so directly after what happened. And the UN General Assembly, it was, I think, only Justin Trudeau who actually you know, spoke about Iran. And UN women didn't even post anything on the social media about the women in Iran for a whole week during the General Assembly. And I was, I came to the plenary and there was Mr. Joseph Boyer who was just mumbling yet another press release. I mean, the old it's traditional, yeah, I meant mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. I was so tired of it and I was so frustrated and I was so angry because here you have women who had no guns, they have, they have nothing to defend themselves with without, beside the voices they had. And 
the EU could not even respond with a proper, you know, <laughs> solidarity with a proper voice saying we are on your side. He was just, you know, we will take into consideration if it comes, and that is not good enough. No, uh, but the mumbling, yes, he does, he does mumble. He mumbles a lot, he does actually. Enunciation should be taught in his uh, office. Uh, I sometimes wonder if, I mean, why doesn't anyone criticize Iran? Let's just generalize a little. We haven't seen a single European country. We haven't seen Olaf Scholz hold a you know, passionate speech about the women's rights in Iran. We haven't seen Macron. We haven't seen Ushkistashon, our Swedish government. So we haven't seen, instead, we've seen like you in the parliament, we've seen maybe Ursula von der Leyen, the, the president of the European Commission, has made a statement. And I'm wondering if it's very, very practical for a lot of big countries who have economic interest in Iran to just, you know, we we'll let Borrell mumble about it in our name for us, and therefore we don't have to take the diplomatic fight with Iran. If we go back to yeah. years, Catherine Ashton, the former, or the, the lady who, who had the role of Joseph Borrell many years ago, and of course Federica Mogherini, the Italian yeah. woman who was head of the EU's external action service, they were working with building up relations with Iran, the airfield of course with that nuclear deal. So there's a lot at stake here mm -hmm. for Iran for the EU. Yeah, I mean it's true that there, there may be fear that indeed this is an Iranian led movement and change should come from within. I think history teaches us, especially I think in the case of Iran, that indeed um, meddling into um, Iranian national affairs doesn't always pay off. So perhaps there is that fear as well on top of the economic uh, consequences. But I think, and especially as a woman, I really would like to acknowledge the, the power of female anger and engagement in Iran, and I think we should support that. And as we just discussed, there is much more that the EU can do. Again, uh, economic uh, sanctions, there's now, I believe, a meeting of the EU foreign affairs ministers, a meeting where indeed on individuals within the regime, for example, the sports minister who was involved in the case of the Iranian athlete, he is going to be on the list, uh, there's uh, visa sanctions, etc. There's a lot that the EU can do. And just on the calls, there's calls as well on the European Union to call the Revolutionary Guard a terrorist group. We reported about it earlier here on Euronews. And the European Parliament also passed a resolution asking for this to happen. The European Commission President as well, Ursula von der Leyen, seems to be in favour. Germany, France and the Netherlands too. But it seems that the directive needs to come from a court, from an EU member. That's what Joseph Borrell said. Is, is that true? Do you have any information on that? And what has the EU just said? Well, I mean, the, the Council could go either way. Uh, they have a review of the, the list that they uh, of over terrorists that they do every six months, and that I mean that review is ongoing. And there they can actually choose if there is political will without waiting for the court decision. Uh, but also there is this proper way that where you 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 don't need the political will to have a, a court decision that will be made for you and that therefore put the political pressure on you. Uh, but. Uh, I mean, it is very clear, the signals are very clear. We, it, I mean, the Iranians have been presenting the evidence about why the IRGC should be put on the terrorist list. Uh, but them dragging their feet behind them at the council, uh, I, I really fail to understand. I'm trying my best, but I do fail to understand what, I mean, you can say economic reasons, you can say all of that, but still, children are being killed on the streets. With girls who are not being sexually active yet are being raped before execution so they don't get into paradise according to the Mullah's rhetorics. Women, men are losing their lives on the street and I, no, I don't understand. And now it's even, yes sir? I mean it seems another case of Lee Borrell not choosing his words carefully uh, because von der Leyen already said that the Commission would be in favour, so clearly there's ways to make this happen. It seems a question of political will, um, and it seems also a question of taking away the business um, of indeed uh, the, the movement from within, and I think therefore that would be a really important signal. Okay, we'll have to wait and see what happens in Iran, but zooming out of Iran and looking at the picture across the globe, the European Parliament presented its annual report this week on the state of human rights and democracy worldwide. We can show you some of the findings in that report. It said that less than half of the world's population now live in a democracy of some sort and more than 37% live under authoritarian rule. It said the energy crisis is fueling poverty and human rights setbacks as well across the world. And it says the COVID pandemic as well has had an, a detrimental impact on human rights as well. That's pretty grim reading, Teresa. I don't know if you've read the report. It's pretty comprehensive, pretty lengthy. I've just given you three examples of what's been written there. But 
I, I haven't read the report, but what I would look for in it as a, as a European affairs correspondent, I would see, uh, on the, I would look at which of the European Union countries they were risking, you know, driving off into non-democratic areas, for instance, we have had, and we know that we have an ongoing dispute with Hungary and Poland, because the European Union cannot, as a group, point finger at the dictator from other parts of the world and said, you know, we're not going to trade with you until you change your manners. If we have inside our union, questionable elements, questionable countries in the area of democracy. Yeah. And Elizabeth, a question for you, and of course for yourself as an MEP, with the corruption scandal of the parliament in, in, in Poland right now, will that change anything you think? Well, I hope so. I, I clearly, on, on top of me looking into the data and having a clear picture of who is involved and what interests are at stake, clearly I think when it comes to, to the parliament and, and also broader, we need to look um, into what uh, rules do we have in, in, in 